to stammer. And the power of God begins to flow out of them. I, I, I love it. But uh, that's not what I'm, I could preach on that today, but that's not my, my message. For those of you that do not know us, my name is Jonathan Thacker. And I'm here with my beautiful wife, Brittany, who just this last week, we celebrated 15 years of marriage. So you guys pray for her because she is stuck with me. But uh, we have two children with us, Tyson and Kinsley Joe, who are, I guess, in Children's Church right now. And I hope that you guys get an opportunity to meet them. But we, we travel around. Uh, we are full-time evangelists. It's kind of strange and funny at the same time how it worked out. Pastor Ben had, or I say, Pastor, I'm doing it too. The new Arkansas DYD, if I can say it like that, uh, he had contacted us even before he had ever known that he was going to transition, and he had booked us and uh, for, for a couple Sundays, and then, of course, you know that he moved on to, uh, uh, to the place that God had ordained for him to be, and, and I'm so excited about what God's going to do in their lives, and I'm excited about the new, I have, have yet to um, had the privilege of meeting your new pastor, but I have no doubt that God has ordained for the right person to be in the right place, amen. But we're excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, anyone that knows me, we, we, my, my family and I, we are in a different church just about every, every week, and one thing that we love to do is we usually will take a Tuesday and that will be what we call our family day and we will go and, and we love to go to museums. And uh, some time back, my family and I went to the Titanic Museum. Some of you may have been to one. Uh, you may have been to this particular one. But we went to the Titanic Museum. I've always been fascinated with this story. But I'll never forget what happened. When you, if, if you've been there, you know when you first walk in, to the museum, they will hand you a slip of paper, and that paper has a name on it. And I took the paper, put it in my pocket, and I began to go through uh, the different tours. They would have, you know, things that they'd brought up from the sunken ship, things, artifacts, uh, ball gowns, life vests that were just seemed to be frozen in time. All these different things they had on display. They even had one place where you could put your hand uh, in the frigid water and see how cold it was that night on the sinking of the Titanic. But I've since been so fascinated with this story that I've gone back and I've begun to dig a little bit deeper and I've begun to discover there's a lot of things that we don't know about the sinking of the Titanic. We know the Titanic today is the ship, the largest ship that set sail that had been sunk. But did you know that prior to the sailing that of the Titanic, that the Titanic was already a world-renowned ship? We know it today for its sinking, but even years before the Titanic had ever set sail, people were already talking about the ship, the safest ship to have ever been built, the ship that was said to be the fastest ship in the world, the largest, most luxurious ship in the world. At that time, in that moment, in the early 1900s, the Titanic was a sense of man's accomplishment. There was a great sense of pride and there was a great sense of look how far that we have come. Look what mankind to do. Look what the knowledge and the wisdom of man can accomplish. There was a spirit or a sense of man trusting in their own strength and not in the Lord's. There was a spirit, if you will, of we don't need God anymore. We've evolved. Now you'll not see that heading on the newspaper of the day, but that spirit was there. One man even had the boldness to say that God himself cannot sink this ship. After all, the ship had been built by the greatest minds of the times, the greatest architects, the greatest engineers that money could buy. But ironically, on the ship's very first voyage, that which the world said was impossible happened and the Titanic became a display to the world that just maybe we need God after all in today's world you don't have to look very far to see that very same spirit is there that spirit of that spirit of pride that spirit of we've got knowledge we've got wisdom we've got all these advances and and science and in technology why do we need church 
Why, why do we need religion? Why do we need Jesus? And I just come to remind you this morning, friend, that Acts 4 and 12 still says that nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The stirring in my spirit today is, I shared with you that we visit a lot of churches. But I've found that there's a lot of people that go to church but are not in church. I found there's a lot of people that go to church, they get their ticket punched, they, they go through the motions, they do all. They, they See, we can't get to heaven by church attendance. We can't get to, to heaven by singing songs or going through the motions. There is only one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. Christ. You were singing just a moment ago about, uh, about him being my savior and the thought went through my mind of, of, you know, there's a lot of things. He's my strong tower. He's my defense. He's my, he's all of these, has, he's my king. He has all of these titles, but the greatest thing is he is my savior. He left everything. He left heaven. He left angels. He left everything in that world to come to this world so that you and I can have an opportunity to be saved. And sometimes we forget that Jesus never said get saved. He said repent and believe. So I've simply titled my sermon this morning, Believe on Jesus. And if you have your Bibles, I would like to you, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And we'll read about the first seven verses there. In the world we live in, how many people will be saved? And how many will be lost? Acts chapter 16, verse 25. If you're there, somebody shout amen. The scripture says this. It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. Saints, will you help me pray this morning over the message today? Lord, we love you today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we can be here. Lord, we thank you Lord for a house that we can come in and magnify and worship you and hear your word but Father I confess Lord I'm not able to move without you I'm not able to speak without you so Lord I just ask that you would loose these lips of clay today Father I would ask that you would anoint and open ears and, and anoint hearts and open hearts to receive this message Lord if there's any here today Lord that does not know you if there is any here today that has anything that separates them Lord from you ask in the name of Jesus that you would send the Holy Spirit Lord to convict and convince and draw us all to a deeper place with you in the mighty name of Jesus we ask and everyone said amen and amen now we know let me just set this text up for you quickly Paul and Silas has had been preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. They'd been preaching Christ crucified and, and there was a fortune telling slave girl that began to follow after them and began to mock them and make fun of them and Paul being full of the Holy or forgive me, uh, yes Paul being full of the Holy Spirit, he turned around and he had the power to cast the unclean spirit out of this woman. Well when he did this the owners of the slave girl, the fortune telling slave girl, they were no longer able to use the young lady as they had been using her. 
And because of what happened, they'd see they'd made a great deal of money off her. And because of what had happened, they could no longer use her to make money. Well, to make a long story short, they got mad. And they went to the authorities and they said, he has cast this spirit out and we can no longer. So they take Paul and Silas, who did a good thing, and they have them unjustly and unfairly thrown into prison. Not only did they throw them into prison, but they beat them. They, 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 they had bloodied them. They'd beaten them. And they locked them up. But what's amazing, that in spite of the circumstance, yet Paul and Silas, see, I'm sure that they didn't feel like praying. I'm sure that in that moment, they didn't feel like much like raising their hands. But in that moment, the Scripture says that they were heard singing praises to God. And because of what had happened, there was a great earthquake. Now, I want you to understand that this earthquake that shook the prison was not a natural phenomenon. See, oftentimes in Scripture, you'll see the hand of God move by way of a great earthquake. The doors literally had shaken so hard that not just one or two shackles fell off, not just one or two doors had opened, but each and every door had opened and every shackle had fallen off. Verse 27 says, And the keeper of the prison awakened. You see, God does not always manifest himself in a still small voice. There are times when he makes himself known in other forms. How many times have we seen the, the hand of God move to shake the people out of a spiritual slumber? Sometimes we go through things that this flesh really doesn't want to go through. But in the end of it, God has good that will come out of it. Why does he shake us? Why does sometimes he put things in our path? And the reason is the same today, that every soul might be saved. That's God's desire for every one of us. Not just to go to church, not just to go through the motions, not to have a perception by the world to be seen as good or holy, but to have the perception of God to look down upon us and see us as separate. Second Peter 3 and 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us that not any should perish. The deep truth of the matter is it was not a physical sleep that the jailer was awakened from, but a spiritual one. In that moment, that jailer had an awakening. In that moment, that jailer was aroused from a guilty and a dead conscience. And he knew inside that he was guilty, that he was bound in sin. And he needed this Jesus that Paul and Silas had been singing about. He knew in that moment that he needed something more. And he comes stumbling out of the darkness and he said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas called out into the darkness. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Now I want to be clear that believing on Jesus is not the same as simply believing in his existence. Because scripture tells us that even the demons and Lucifer himself believe that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead. See, we obtain this gift of salvation by believing. But Jesus, even in the book of Mark, he said, he said to repent and believe. There is a, a two-part, listen, we, we can't just come to an altar and say, God, forgive me, and I feel bad about what I've done, and I forget, and sometimes we say, I feel bad about what I'm going to do tomorrow, so I just lay this at your feet. Jesus said, repent. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, we've seen it cheapened. We've heard it preached. I'm not saying here, I'm just saying in the churches of America. We've been told that all you've got to do is come down to an altar and pray a prayer and invite Jesus into your heart and everything will be all right. But hear me, friend, repentance is not praying a prayer. I like how y'all are shouting. Repentance is not praying a prayer. Repentance is a change of mind and a change of direction. If, if, for instance, this morning, let's say, let's say we went fishing today. And we go out to the fishing hole and, and we throw a line in and we catch a fish and we pull the fish up out of the water. 
Now we understand that the nature of a fish is to live in water. You take a fish out of the water for very long, the fish will die. And if you take the fish out of the water and throw him up onto the bank, he may survive for a little while, but if you leave him on the bank, he's going to die. Saints, and so it is with us. If we, we go swimming and, and you hold my head down under the water long enough, eventually this old boy is going to quit kicking because my nature is not to breathe under the water. Are you with me? And so it is with sin. No, I'm not saying Jesus never said go and be perfect and never fall short. We'll never make that mark. But he said to put our eyes on that mark. We should have a frame of mind that I'm never going to mess up. I'm never going to be pulled out of the water and thrown into the bank. But we understand that it will happen. And what happens is one day you'll be walking along and, and something will pull you out and you'll be up on the bank and see what it is where well, you have an awareness. I can't be here. I can't stay here because I understand if I stay on this bank, I will die. And then we get put back into the water. But oftentimes, I see people that live on the bank. Grace covers everything so I can stay here. Hear me, friend. You can't stay here. If you've got something that separates you from God, if you've got something in your life that the Spirit is convicting you about and drawing you away from, you can't just say, God, forgive me. You've got to turn away from those things. And when the Spirit speaks and we push Him away, that's not repentance, friend. That is rebellion. On the night of April 4th, 1912, the world-renowned Titanic set sail across the Atlantic Sea. It was said that it was a magnificent 46,000 tons of steel. It was 11 stories high, and it was the largest cruise liner to have ever been built. To stand on the deck that night, one passenger said that it gave her such a sense of wonderful security. But at 11.40 p.m., the greatest maritime disaster in history took place. And the great Titanic, the white star, the pride of the white star fleet, collided with an iceberg and grinded to a halt. And in less than 10 seconds, a 300-foot gas was torn down the belly of the boat. There were some 2,340 people on board, of which 705 were saved, and the other 1,635 souls were lost at sea. It was the first time that the ship had ever set sailed and it had worldwide publicity. It was dubbed not only as the world's largest and the most luxurious ship, but also as the safest ship to have ever set sail. People from all walks of life walked calmly and collectively, bought their ticket to be one of the first to make history, to be one of the first to set sail on what was sold to them as the safest ship in the world. Many people that morning had no idea that that day would be their last day. And friends, so it is with us today. Death comes unexpectedly. There are many people today that will, not, that will leave their homes and they will not arrive home. Even just this last week in my hometown, a man was walking through his yard and he was struck by lightning. We understand that no one sees it coming, but every person in the building one day we will stand before God. And the scripture says, as the tree falls, so it lies. The Titanic was a picture of luxury. It had tennis courts. It had ballrooms. It had everything that we could imagine. Many things that the ships of today have. We've seen them. We've seen the luxury. We've seen the, the rock climbing walls. We've seen all of this stuff that are on board many of the ships today. But in this day, it was the very first of its kind. I found out that the average salary of that day was in between $500 and $600 a year. The best suites on board the Titanic were reserved for some $4,300 a suite. Only $2,300 if you wanted a suite with outside the outside walkways. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of money in the early 1900s. That's a lot of money now. Amen. Amen. The most expensive ship in the world. It had everything. 
but it did not have enough lifeboats. But after all, it was the unsinkable ship. After all, it was impossible. It could never happen. It was the largest ship to have ever been built. It's 11 stories tall, three or four city blocks long. I found out that it had a six foot, six foot thick double belly on the bottom and it had 15 watertight compartments for additional safety. But not enough lifeboats. Who would have ever dreamed that the ship would be an accident, in an accident yet alone sink? The world said that this ship was unsinkable. The world told us that it was impossible. There was never a ship that had set sail that had given the people more confidence and security. Can you imagine today knowing what we know today? If we could somehow travel back in time and warn the people as they all begin to as they all begin to walk upon the board of the Titanic as they traveled across that corridor and if you could be standing there to warn them don't get on the ship we know the future we know what's coming don't take another step how many people would listen to the warning how many souls that day would be saved and how many would be lost found out that there was a total of 20 lifeboats on the ship that would hold a maximum of 58 people. So that means if if every lifeboat had been filled to capacity, that out of the 2,340 people, it was possible for only 1,160 to be saved. The The crew in this moment, they were completely untrained for an emergency response. If you get on a ship today, they've been trained on what to do in case there was an emergency. But in this day, they did not know what to do. I found out that many on that day, there was no muster drill. Many of them, they, even the, the, the lifeboats themselves, they had no provision. They had no sails. They, they had no water. They had no compass. Even many of those lifeboats, the plugs had been pulled out of the bottoms of the boats. How many people will stand before one God, before God one day without the proper provision? How many people will stand before God and they'll point to their church attendance, they'll point to their tithe record, they'll point to their good deeds of all of these different things that may be in the eyes of man that they are good. But friend, hear me friend, then when at the hour of judgment when we stand before God, we must have Jesus. It's not just going to church and getting your ticket punched. It's a relationship. It's believing, yes, that Jesus died and he rose. But we must have repentance in our lives. We must believe on Jesus. I'm convinced that there are many people that go to church. And they they, they sing the songs. They go through the motions. But. But when they stand before God, found out that there were three warnings that were sent from the crow's nest to the officer on the bridge just 15 minutes before the Titanic had struck. And finally, in the last moment, the officer picked up the phone, but it was too late. It was just seconds before the crash. Many of the people in that moment, they were, they were partying, they were drinking, they were having a big time on the unsinkable ship, the Titanic. Even after the stewards had come down and warned them that the ship was sinking. I, I read that there was a group of gamblers in, about, about in the belly of the ship and they came up and they came out to the edge of the ship and they seen the iceberg and they seen the damage and they assessed it and then they went back down to the card game. To sink with the ship. Even after that they'd been warned that the ship was sinking. Even after that they'd been told time and time again to get onto the lifeboat. Many people that night went on to bed in full confidence of the Titanic's ability to stay afloat. Others joked about wearing life jackets. They said, why should we put the life jacket on? Why should we go and, and get out into your little, your little vessel? We all know that you're just going to take us out for a few hours. We all understand that this is procedure. This ship will never sink. They refused 
to put on the jacket. We don't want to ruin our ball gowns. We don't want to ruin our tuxedos. Many of them laughed. Hear me, friend. Many people today laugh at what this book says. Many people today laugh when, when we said that we've got to be set apart from the world, that we can't look like the world. We can't go the places that the world goes. We can't listen to the same things. We can't be like many people laugh at us when we tell them that Jesus is about to come back. Many people alive, hear me somebody, you don't have to be a, a whiz to understand that America is sinking. We are in a dangerous time. We are in the last hour. Make no mistake, friend. Behold, I tell you a mystery that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Hear me somebody, it won't be very long. And these songs that we've been singing about, what all the preachers have been preaching about, it's going to happen. Do you know what some of them did? Let me tell you, the movie doesn't tell you much. Some of them, one lady was seen, eyewitness account, as she went and to the iceberg and she chipped off a piece of ice, a rather large piece of ice, and she's carrying it back to her stateroom. A lady from aboard the lifeboat was heard calling to her, Ma'am, what are you doing with that ice? Where are you going? She said, Oh, I'm taking it back to my stateroom. She said, When we get to New York, I've got a lot of friends that I want to show this to. Little did she know that that ship had gone as far as it was going to go. Many of the people could have been saved. Had they got onto the lifeboats, I read that lifeboat, at, they had a capacity of 58, a capacity of nearly 60 people. Yet the very first boats that began to be pulled away with 10 people and 12 people and 15 people. Empty seats as the boats were going away, not because there was not enough room for them, but because they really did not believe that the ship was sinking. Many people today would take Jesus as their Savior if they really believed that Jesus was about to come back. Every seat in this building would be full this morning if people believed that by tonight's end, Jesus could come back, that the trumpet could sound and we could be raptured out of this place. Many people would come if they truly believed that there was a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. But the reason that so many people are out in the other things of the world is that they may proclaim Christianity. They may, they may say, oh, I believe, I believe. But the truth is, if they really believed, it would live like the book says. I believe that in, in Christian America, in American Christianity, many of us are deceived. We look at other people and we say, well, you know, brother so-and-so, they did this and, and I'm better than them. Sister such-and-such, such, you know, I know she goes down to the bar and I, I'm better than. See, there's a reason why Jesus said not for us to compare ourselves with each other. I read where the final parting of the, the ship's. As the lifeboats pulled away, it's terrible. I read where I read where there was one man who who had enough money. Many actually who had enough money that day as the ship began to sink, as there became a stampede for the remaining lifeboats. As reality struck, and they really understand that the ship that was about to go down. I found out that there were many people on board the Titanic that day. They had enough money to buy the Titanic in its entirety, but in that moment, they did not have enough money to buy a seat on the lifeboat. Can you imagine the, the, the fight? Can you imagine the stampede as, as all the, can you imagine the rich people that stood out on board of the deck, many in the finest clothes that you could ever buy, many of the women with diamonds, millions of dollars, millions of dollars of diamonds strung about their necks, but in that moment they were no different than the poorest steward on those ships. Fighting for a seat on the lifeboat. Eyewitnesses said that the final parting was terrible. That many, that many women and, and children were pulled away from their husbands. Women and, and husbands held on to each other as the ship began to sink. 
One eyewitness said that there was a, uh, they'll never forget that there was a young boy around 12 years of age that, that stood out on the edge of the deck and his father was standing next to him. And they said, I don't know how many people came by to that little boy and tried to lure him away to get him onto a lifeboat. Begged him, take a seat on the light boat. But that little boy clung to his father. And that father clung right back to that little boy. Now some people think, well, how romantic. How, how, how much love that is for that child to love his father. And how much that father must have loved that child. But hear me, friend, if that daddy really loved that baby, he would have thrown him onto the lifeboat. Mamas and daddies, hear me. There is a heaven to gain. And there is a hell to shun. That daddy may have loved him in the world's view. Those parents may have provided food and shelter and, and, and a good home and a good bed. They may have provided all of those things. But hear me, mom and daddy. If we fail to teach our sons and daughters the truth, I know that, that Psalms 14 says that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God, but I want you to understand today that it is more foolish to believe in God and live like there's not one. It's more foolish to believe in God and raise your children like there is no heaven and no hell. So final light boats pulled away from the Titanic. They were huddled, shivering together. And the band began to strike up a song. In the very last moments, in the brink of eternity, that, that band who all, uh, all the time before had been playing the hits of the day, in that moment their eyes began to be set on eternity. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. And they began to play, Nearer my God to Thee. One man was seen standing on the ship of the, the top deck of the ship, and he was heard as another man asked him, they said, Why didn't you get onto the lifeboat? Why didn't where is your life jacket? And he was heard to respond, I didn't really think I would need it. How many people will stand before God one day? And the question will be asked, What did you do with Jesus? And many will say, I didn't really think I would need him. Him, my friend, we need him. There's no other way to heaven without Jesus. It doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter who our mama and our daddy is. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters but a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's all that matters. Did you know that at the sinking of the Titanic, there was another ship less than 10 miles away. Later, there was an investigational hearing where the captain of that ship was asked, being so close, why didn't you come to the rescue? Being so close, why didn't you offer some type of assistance? And the captain said, well, at midnight, we had turned our radios and went to, off and we went to bed. The watchman, he testified, he's seen, he, could, he was in view of the sinking ship, the Titanic. And he said as deck by deck began to go beneath the waters, he said he knew it was the Titanic and as the lights began to go out, he said that I, I thought that the Titanic being faster than we, that she was just sailing off into the distance. How many people? Are within 10 miles of us. How many people, maybe even in this building, we've got to have Jesus. We've got to tell people about, I know it's not popular. I know it's not easy to be a Christian, and it's certainly not easy to tell people when they mock you. But this gospel is true. Jesus is about to come back. Well, preacher, I've been hearing that my whole life. And when it happens, friend, God will say to you, sir or ma'am, 
Did I not give you enough warning? Did I not send enough preachers? Did I not send enough of the gospel? Did the Holy Spirit not draw you enough? But it's our choice to receive him or to reject him. Can I have you musician just come and begin to play for me? As we're about to move into the altars. There was a man by the name of John Harper. John Harper was a, a famous evangelist preacher of the times, if you will. And he boarded the Titanic with his daughter. When the ship began to sink, him being a widower would have had the opportunity to put his child, and him being a widower, he could have gotten onto the ship, the boat with her because there were so many boats leaving with 10 and 12 and 15. There were so many empty seats, he could have got onto that boat. But he put his little girl onto the boat and stayed behind. He said there's thousands of people on this, on this ship that are about to meet their maker. And he stayed behind to give the masses one last opportunity to receive the gospel. Harper was seen running from lifeboat to lifeboat, shouting, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. pleading with them in their last moments to give their lives to Jesus. One man was seen to reject his, his warning rather sternly. And he pushed him away. I don't want anything to do with you or your God. And it was in that moment they said they witnessed John Harper take the life vest off his neck and said, you're going to need this more than me. That's a man who believes. That's a man who believes that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. To the last moments, he was seen pleading with the people to give their lives to Jesus. Not just to pray a little prayer, not just to go through the motions, but to truly accept him as Lord and Savior. See, everybody wants Jesus to be their Savior, but not everybody wants Him to be their Lord. After the ship went down, four years after, there was what was called a Titanic reunion where all of the survivors that, that had made it out, they all gathered together in one building. They began to give their own accounts. They began to give their testimony of, of what they had seen and what they had heard. One survivor, he said, I remember the preacher, John Harper. He said, after the ship sank, he said, I was in the frigid water and I was holding on to a piece of debris. And he said, I heard some splashing in the darkness. There was a man that swam up to me and he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I didn't know anything about that stuff. And he said, I pushed him away. He said, now I held on to that debris for a little while, but I don't know if he, if he got turned around. I don't know what happened. Or, but I heard him come back. And he, and he pleaded with me, friend, believe on the Lord Jesus and he said, having a second opportunity, I gave my life to Jesus. He stood before that congregation and he said, I am the last convert of John Harper. Friend, we're only one breath away from eternity. And I know you've heard this over and over and over, but I'm here to plead with somebody this morning. Give your life to Jesus. Now, I understand. I, I can't tell you how many times I went to an altar and prayed the prayer, Lord, forgive me and help me. But I always held on to something inside. If you've got things in your life today that 
Listen, it's not my words that's convicting you, friend. That's the Holy Spirit. And if you've got anything that separates you from Him, I'm here to plead with you today. Give it all to Him. I've never seen a man or a woman follow Jesus and live to regret it. There are many of us, not just in the church, in the world, we need to be shaken. See, sometimes we forget when, when Paul and Silas, when they ministered to the jailer, he didn't just pray a prayer. He who had previously beat them, now he washed their stripes. And he set food on the table. There was an action. There, that's what repentance is. It's not just praying a prayer. It's turning away from the old man, turning away from the things of the world. The scripture says, if a man be a new creation. If you're not a new creation. Because you don't really know him. I'm not, I'm not here to. I know this probably isn't the most popular message to be preaching. But I, I'm on a mission. You're here and you've got things in your life. I don't care who you are. I don't care what it is. I'm not. It's between you and God. Scripture says every weight and sin. It may not even be sin that you're dealing with. I don't, I don't know. I don't pretend to know. But if you've got some things in your life that the Spirit is drawing you this morning, in just a moment I'm going to ask you to come. And we're going to pray together. This church is going to pray with you. Jesus said, let my house be a house. Well, preacher, what do people laugh at me? Let them laugh. Somebody laughs at you, they need to be down here with you. I believe in public profession. Jesus openly carried the cross down Calvary. The least that we can do is take a few steps in a congregation of people that aren't going to, nobody's going to attack you. We're here to cheer you on. Scripture says when a man comes to repentance that the angels in heaven rejoice. I believe this church will rejoice with you. If you've got things, if, maybe you've never met Jesus. Maybe you've never really prayed that prayer. Maybe you've never met it. Maybe you've never repented. See, John the Baptist preached repent. Jesus preached repent. All of the disciples said repent. And if you've got something that's separate, listen, I've made up my mind. I don't care if I had to pray every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I may, Listen, I don't care if i got to get up two hours early every day of my life. I'm going to heaven. There's nothing in this world that's going to keep me out. But if you've got anything, I, this preacher wants to pray with you. I plead with you, don't walk out of this house. The way that you came. So if you're here and you say, preacher, you're talking to me. I, I, I need prayer. I've got something in my life. I don't listen. I don't care what it is. God knows and you know. Let's not just go through the motions today. Let's get it right with God. Preacher, you're talking to me. Come on, I want to pray with you. You don't have to wait on anything or anybody. Preacher, I, I, I've got something. I, I need prayer today. I'm going to wait a moment. Come on, church, begin to pray.